Similarly, if you're trying to keep people cool in a hot, humid place, of course, let's remember we're cooling people. The building itself has no central nervous system. Uh, you know, you ask a Japanese person, uh, why don't you cool your house? And she says, why should I? Is the house hot? Uh, there are about 10 things we can do to expand the range of comfort conditions. Uh, some are straightforward, like a good ceiling fan buys you five Celsius degrees of high-end comfort. ASHRAE credits you for half that because they arbitrarily assume the flow is laminar, but actually the flow as they measured is turbulent and it's worth five degrees, not two and a half. Uh, radiant comfort is half your comfort sensation, so having spectrally selective or shaded glazings is extremely important. You can keep your backside a few degrees cooler by sitting on a ventilative net or mesh chair like the Herman Miller Aeron rather than sitting on insulating upholstery. And by the way, comfort theory is not entirely correct. I can put a photograph of an icy blue waterfall on the wall and you will feel cooler even though comfort theory says it shouldn't matter. Uh, <clears throat> then, of course, it's vital to minimize unwanted gains of heat into the space from inside or from outside. Then there are passive cooling methods which are employed very effectively in all traditional architecture, including the old Singapore verandas. Uh, and then there's active non-refrigerative cooling. We can deal with latent loads with either desiccant or absorption, and then if we hybridize those with direct indirect evaporative, we can get over 100 units of cooling per unit of electricity if we're really good at it. Now, if you did want refrigerative cooling, you can get a COP around 6.8 for process or 6 point maybe 1 for comfort in Singapore at the design hour. Uh, Mr. Lee routinely does this. The uh, COP6 uh, retrofit and postcon is pretty standard, about a two-year payback. And then you can do cool storage and controls if there's anything left to store and control. But actually, in order to eliminate most or all of your cooling electricity, you don't really need to go beyond step four because that will do the job anywhere in the world with much less energy than refrigerative cooling and often less capex. So a worthy goal is actually to get rid of refrigerative air conditioning. If we really think properly about whole building design, uh, it's not as hard as it sounds. And I know you have a really tough climate, but we have a similar one in New Orleans uh, and we have classical old houses there that are very comfortable all summer with no air con. They just do massing, shading, and ceiling fans. I've dug into Mr. Lee's practice, uh, now at Train, formerly at Supersymmetry Services, looking at standard uh, components of a big water-cooled centrifugal system and design conditions versus what he's able to achieve and this means using exemplary fans like a, say, 82 to 85 percent efficient vein axial at variable volume, wringing out most of the friction in the ducts and the piping systems, using very efficient uh, primary only pumps, using very close approach temperatures uh, throughout because copper is cheaper than electricity, optimizing the impeller speed, one gear ratio costs the same as another. Uh, and using short, fat cooling towers with oversized fill and big slow fans, not small, fast fans, and then dispatching your entire face area of cooling towers at once uh, at variable speed. Uh, <clears throat> so this adds up to 0.58 or so kilowatts per ton COP6, uh, three times better than common practice, but cheaper and... Uh, gives better comfort, and including comfort over the whole turndown range. Uh, and if you're in a process application like a chip fab, you can push it to about 6.8 with a dual chilled water temperature. Uh, now there is a trick to it, <clears throat> and that is low face velocity, high coolant velocity coils. Um, in 1921, Willis Carrier misinterpreted his lab data to say that airflow in a coil is turbulent and condensation is in a uniform film. But actually, when Sam Luxton in Adelaide built a wind tunnel and looked at it, he found that the flow is laminar and the condensation is dropwise. 
So if you use the usual several meter per second face velocity, those droplets get smeared out and blown away and you lose their extended surface area, which is a great free asset. But if you use less than a meter per second, uh, then you get about 29% better dehumidification per unit of sensible cooling. A good way to do this is to take the normal deep dense coil and turn it round sideways so you're blowing the same flow of air through the same kilograms of copper but with sparse fin spacing only maybe two or three rows which means you can actually clean it and now the air side pressure drop goes down by a factor 20 so the supply fan gets smaller and all the supply fan energy used to make the air hotter which showed up as an evaporator load so now you can make the chiller smaller in other words the parasitic buildup now it runs backwards. You get a virtuous circle instead of a vicious circle of parasitics. So the whole system, again, gets smaller, simpler, cheaper, and you get comfort over the entire load range with dramatically less energy. Of course, in air handling, the basic physics is the same as for pumps, and we're used to just looking at improving fan efficiency and motor efficiency as if everything else were immutable. And indeed, there's roughly a factor two opportunity from the best fan and motor systems and variable speed drive. But then there's a factor often five or 10 opportunity to wring out flow and friction. Flow by changing uh, the airflow according to your actual health goals, real-time sensors like CO2 sensors, displacement ventilation, which is much more effective than turbulent induction, and of course, reducing the amount of fresh air you need because you're not putting poisonous materials in the building and reducing the amount of cool you need because the building envelope and equipment are more efficient. And then you reduce pressure drop by wringing out friction. It is astonishing to me that the standard ASHRAE technique for balancing ducts is that if you haven't enough friction in an unbalanced system, you add more rather than taking it away where there's too much. Uh, very strange. But, you know, because of the fifth power dependence, if you go from, say, a 50 to a 60 centimeter duct, you're saving 60% of your fan power right there. And the less um, flow you need to deliver cool because you make the building and its internals more efficient, the more you are effectively upsizing conventional ducts because they've got less flow to carry. So if you combine all of these, then you can down, downsize the chillers quite dramatically as well as the fans. Uh, a couple of local numbers. Uh, when Mr. Lee's team worked on the Grand Hyatt Singapore, look at the pre and post retrofit improvements. Really quite dramatic. 45% saving overall, even though, as I recall, uh, they weren't able for various reasons to do much on the air side. Just the chilled water pump efficiency, three quarter saving. Condenser water pump, 60 or 70%. Or if you look at the uh, postcom, uh, just before and after kilowatts, quite dramatic. These are local examples. Please, if you're not familiar with them, make yourself familiar with them, whatever exists is possible. <laughs>